Good evening. First, a few news notes. Mercury passed in transit across the face of the sun. Douglas Arnold photographed it from Australia, and there is Mercury. But do remember, never point a telescope or a camera at the sun direct. It's very dangerous indeed. There has, of course, been the repair to the Hubble Space Telescope. I was in Florida watching the astronauts take off. These are the photographs I took at the time, and believe me, it was most impressive. As we now know, the repair has been a complete success. The solar panels and the wide field planetary camera have been replaced, and CoStar has been inserted to correct for the fault in the main mirror. So in a few weeks, we should now get the first pictures back from the new Hubble, a really great triumph. We've heard a great deal recently about missing mass. There seems to be a great deal of material in the universe that we can't see. Is it due to low mass stars? Is it locked up in black holes? Or is it due to some kind of material about which we know absolutely nothing? I'm sure you've heard of quasars, which are remote, superluminous objects. You've probably also heard of gravitational lensing, when the light from a remote body is affected if it passes close to the gravitational field of something else between the remote body and ourselves. Well, Dr. Mike Hawkins of Edinburgh has been studying the lensing effect of unseen bodies upon quasars and has come up with some very interesting results. Well, over the last 18 years or so, I've been monitoring the changes in brightness of uh, around 300 quasars. Uh, quasars uh, fluctuate in brightness by uh, factors of two or three uh, on a time scale of five to ten years. And uh, it, it was to provide a record of, the, of these changes in brightness that the project was designed. What telescope are you using? Uh, we have a, a wide field uh, telescope in Australia known as the uh, uh, UK Schmidt Telescope. Uh, this telescope has a huge field of view and uh, can uh, actually observe th these 300 uh, and more quasars all at the same time. And so in this case, by taking plates again and again over a long period of time, we can uh, monitor the changes in brightness with the telescope. How do you interpret these observations? Well, the observations uh, suggest that the variability is caused by the gravitational lensing effect of large numbers of small compact objects along the line of sight between us and the quasar. What exactly are these lensing objects? Well, there is a line of argument uh, to suggest that they are uh, small black holes about, with about the mass of Jupiter. But surely, an object no more massive than Jupiter couldn't have an obvious lensing effect on the light of a quasar, which is so far away. Yes. Uh, when a, a, a small compact object passes across the line of sight to a distant source, uh, it behaves very much like an ordinary glass lens. The gravitational field of the body will bend the light slightly, causing the uh, source to become brighter. I in this particular case, we are seeing many uh, such objects crisscrossing the line of sight, and the cumulative effect of all, all these uh, uh, encounters is uh, to, to actually cause the light to undulate uh, over on a time scale of five to ten years. How does this work affect the problem of the missing mass in the universe? Well, the, the observations suggest that uh, the, the numbers of these objects is sufficient to make up the missing mass. When we measure the, the, the uh, motions of objects in the universe, we find that the amount of matter necessary to cause those is, is very much more than what we can actually see in the form of stars and galaxies. If there are so many of these things, why haven't they been detected before? Well, uh, funnily enough, um, one of the main uh, objections to the missing mass uh, being in the form of black holes has been that there would be a gravitational lensing effect. Uh, it's just that nobody... Uh, uh, it, di it didn't occur to anybody that, that, this, that the variation of quasars that we see might very well be just that gravitational lensing, lensing effect which was predicted. Well, it certainly sounds very plausible. Is it possible that these effects are due not to lensing, but to effects in the quasars themselves? Well, in principle, uh, quasars could vary intrinsically, uh, th 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 but there, there aren't any specific predictions uh, about the way that they should, certainly over this sort of time scale. Um, however, the, 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 the uh, brightness uh, measurements that we made, the variations in brightness that we observe, uh, su suggest that, in fact, the, the variation can't be intrinsic. One very interesting point occurs to me. How does this work affect our ideas about the future of the universe? Well, uh, cosmological theories which are uh, most favoured at the moment um, su suggest that the universe will in fact not uh, collapse back on itself or indeed I I expand forever into infinity, but will expand ever more slowly. And um, 
th these uh, theories uh, predict uh, a certain amount of missing mass, and it's just that amount of missing mass which, uh, which the, 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 the observations of the quasars have uh, suggested. And so this provides uh, an observational support for, for this theory, and, and hence for the uh, future of the universe predicted by that theory. Mike, congratulations, and thank you very much. Nobel Prizes don't come easily. One has just been awarded to a Professor Joe Taylor of Princeton University for his research into binary pulsars. And these are fascinating things, and of course they're associated with gravitation. I don't think there's much doubt that black holes are the most bizarre objects in the entire universe. Basically, we believe that a black hole is a kind of forbidden area surrounding an old collapsed star that is now pulling so strongly that not even light can escape from it. And if light can't do so, then certainly nothing else can, because light is as fast as anything in the universe. Black holes have been theoretical possibilities for a long time, but only in uh, the last few years have we learnt very much about them. And this is where we need a real expert. And who better than the discoverer of pulsars, Professor Jocelyn Bell Barnell. Jocelyn, welcome back to the sky at night. Thank you, Patrick. First of all, uh, black holes. What particular aspects are we going to talk about this evening? Oh, let's talk about the bits that are fun, Patrick. The bizarre bits, shall we? What a good idea. First of all, how do we get into a black hole? Right, well, the bright stars that we can see shining at the moment, they're held up by the heat and the light that they're generating. That heat and light is counteracting the gravity that would otherwise make them shrink. But as you know, stars don't shine forever. Sooner or later, they're going to run out of fuel and they're going to grow dim. And then the gravity will win because it's no longer balanced. And the gravity will cause the star to shrink, yes. which will put up the gravity at the surface, which will cause the star to shrink, which will put up the gravity at the surface, and so on. Quite so. And it seems that they shrink right, right way down to something pretty tiny. Now, normally, when you squash things, they, they resist. You can squash them so far, yes. and then they fight back. Yep. But under some circumstances, if you've got a really big force, you can do something more drastic. Take this ball, for instance. If I put my weight on it... <laughs> Quite devastating. That's what's happening when material collapses in a black hole. That kind of thing. The material no longer has the strength to fight back. The gravity wins and it goes crumpf down into a black hole. Well, obviously, we can't see these things, so why are they called black holes? There are lots of ways of picturing black holes, Patrick. Let me take you through one or two of these pictures, and I hope it'll become clear. Yes. One way I rather like is by imagining a whole lot of little insects, ants or something like that, on a stretchy rubber membrane. The ants rush hither and thither, and everything's hunky-dory, until one day the ants gather for a meeting, and the membrane begins to bow. This pulls the ants closer together, so the membrane bows more, which pulls the ants closer together, which bows the membrane even more. Yes. And any kind of signal that's trying to get out, like the balls that we've shown rolling in that diagram, those are struggling harder and harder to get out, and they're fewer and further between. And meanwhile, the bow is bowing greater, and it finally necks off completely. It has sealed these little insects off in a little bubble of their own. They're lost to our universe. They're, they're gone. They can't communicate. So that's one way that you get black holes formed. Now, the reason black holes are actually black is because the gravity grabs anything that comes too close and hangs onto it. So any stray spaceships get grabbed, and any light that's trying to get out also gets grabbed. Yeah. It's a bit like fireworks on Guy Fawkes night. <laughs> Any fireworks that you send up at too shallow an angle, they get pulled back down. Yes. Similarly with the light coming off from the surface of the star. We'll think for a moment about one little bit on the surface of the star, and it's shining light rays out in every direction. The rays going out at an angle are pulled down. It's only those ones going within a cone near the vertical that escape. But as the gravity grows, as the star shrinks, more and more of the light rays get pulled down and the cone within which the light can ex escape shrinks, so there's less light getting out, so it's getting fainter. There comes a point, and, and this is called the critical radius, where only the straight-up ray seems to be escaping, and then it too gets pulled back down, 
and no light can get out at that point. The thing has gone completely black. Fascinating stuff. And then, of course, there are these weird and wonderful time effects. I mean, clocks do very strange things near black holes. Yes, they do indeed. If we think, first of all, about the space round a black hole, space is normally flat. But where there's a big mass, it dents that flatness. And where there's a black hole, it doesn't just dent it, it can produce a whole plug hole, like we've got up on the screen at the moment. Now, Einstein told us that space and time are inextricably linked, so it's perhaps not surprising that clocks, that time, go funny as well. Let's suppose you and I were falling into a black hole, Patrick. Yes. Everybody else out there is quite safe on Earth, and they've got splendid telescopes, so good that they can actually read our watches. Yes. And as we fall into the black hole, they do their level best to watch our watches. It gets harder because we get fainter and redder due to the redshift as we get closer to the black hole. But certainly when we're a thousand miles out, they should be able to see quite clearly that our watches are running slow, about seven minutes slow a day. When we're about 30 miles out, however, the watches are going five hours slow every day. And as we cross that critical event horizon, if there were enough light escaping for them to see us, they'd see that our watches had actually paused. Meanwhile, you and I are beginning to notice some funny effects. Yes, indeed. There's a lot more gravity on our feet than on our heads, so our bodies are getting stretched. Finally stretched so much that they're torn apart. And we're killed. It's, it's a different way to go. It doesn't sound very nice to me. Mm. Right, so much for black holes. What about white holes? Is there such a thing as a white hole? There could be. We haven't actually seen any yet. But Einstein's equations which predicted black holes can actually be run in reverse. So as well as having black holes where stuff goes down the tube, you can have the exact opposite. A place where material suddenly appears as from nowhere and spreads out into the universe. And that's what we call a white hole. They may exist, the equations allow it, but we haven't seen any yet. And then that raises another lovely question. Oh, yes. If you can have stuff going down a black hole, can it travel some way and come up somewhere else, completely different, completely different time, and appear out of a white hole? Is there such a thing as a wormhole which will connect a black hole to a white hole? Well, is there? It's been studied a bit, and yes, these wormholes or space-time bridges, they, they do seem to be possible. There's a lovely example of one of these that you may not have realised. Do you know C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe? Oh, yes, I remember reading it a long time ago. Right, well, the wardrobe in that is one of these yes. space-time bridges. Lucy walks into this wardrobe, it's full of fur coats that she loves, yes. and she goes in feeling for the back and she can't find it. So she goes further, and suddenly she finds herself coming out into a completely different country, a completely different time of year, snow on the ground and so on. That's a space-time bridge. She's travelled from one universe to a completely different universe or a bit of the universe. Well, that, of course, is science fiction. Is it always going to stay science fiction, do you think, or is there anything really in it? Sadly, the equations when they're worked through thoroughly, suggest that when you get material going through a wormhole, it actually causes the hole to close off. The tube collapses. So it doesn't look as if we can really get travel through a black hole and out a white hole. But it was lovely science fiction, yes. As I you quite say, agree. It's, it's, it's a lovely idea. Yes. Well, black holes are interesting things, and they're great fun, but they could be rather dangerous if they happen to be close to us. Do you think yes. there are any black holes anywhere near us? And if so, could we see them? Isolated black holes are lethal. You don't spot them until it's too late, till you trip over them. But as you know, a lot of stars are actually in pairs or bigger groupings. Yes, most are. And if you've got a pair of stars and one of them has been and gone and turned into a black hole, you might detect it through its effect on its partner star. Because the gravity of the black hole is going to pull the material down off the partner star It'll spiral around the black hole, getting very hot and bothered, and then gradually fall down it. It reaches temperatures we think of about 10 million, yes, 10 million yes. degrees, before it finally goes over the event horizon. And that means it emits X-rays. 
shortwave optical rays. The X-ray astronomers have discovered several objects in our galaxy that they think might be black holes. They've got a particular signature. The material as it's spiralling in doesn't go in steadily, it goes in blobs. And so the X-rays flicker. And one such object they discovered in the constellation of Cygnus. You've perhaps heard of it. Cygnus X1. It's not visible to the naked eye, but if you were to turn a good telescope on that part of the sky, you'd see a big supergiant star, which is known. It's been catalogued in the Henry Draper catalog, HDE 226868. It's marked uh, with an arrow on that picture. The arrow, of course, was not there originally, and the star nearby is nothing to do with it either. As you observe this supergiant, you see that it's going round in a circle. And what's more, it's going round something that we can't see, something invisible. That invisible object they have deduced is too massive to be anything other than a black hole. So we are rather forced to admit that Cygnus X1 is a black hole twinned with a, a relatively normal supergiant star. So there is at least one in our galaxy, uh, and probably a lot more. You know, I had a look at it the other night with my 15-inch telescope. I turned it towards Cygnus X1, and I saw the supergiant star there, looking like a perfectly ordinary, perfectly ra ra rather faint star. Because you can see Cygnus now, high up in the northwest, and again, it's quite a bright star, one of the summer triangle. Yes. Well, OK, black holes can be rather fearsome things, but I wonder, is there any way in which, in the foreseeable future, or the distant future, a black hole might actually help us? Yes, there is, although I think it is in the distant future. Yeah. I'll have to start by filling you in on a little bit of physics, though, Patrick. Yep. It's the physics to do with rotating black holes, and it must be a rotating one for this trick to work. There is a lovely trick, too. I've got here a pair of objects, mm -hmm. a dustbin and a bag of rubbish. Yes. If I were to shoot this towards a black hole, a rotating black hole, and allow the rubbish to fall into the black hole, this will come whizzing out yes. with lots of extra energy. Yes. Now, you can use that trick to keep the humankind alive. You see, the sun one day will run out of fuel, and it will cease to shine brightly, and that will be the end of life here on Earth. Yeah, about 5,000 million years, something like that. Something yes, like that, yes. yes. I mean, not tomorrow morning. No. It means we can't stay here for various reasons. We've got to find somewhere else to live. So when the sun starts dimming, what we do is we send out the spaceships on an exploratory mission, and we tell them to find us a nice rotating black hole. And having found this black hole, we then send up the materials in order to build a very strong, firm sphere around the black hole. And it must be strong. Any cracks, yes. we're killed. On this sphere, on the outside of it, we build our houses and our cities and our generating stations. Because we have no sunlight, we make our own electricity. We grow our crops under lights, and we keep alive because of this generating station. That's fine. But sooner or later, the generating station is going to sort of grind to a halt. Yes, indeed. When it seems to be running low, what you do is you send out the dust carts. <laughs> You tell everybody to put out their black bags of rubbish and the dust cart collects them all up, brings them back to base, loads them into a special skip, and we fire the skip and the rubbish towards this rotating black hole. The art is then to jettison the rubbish, to let that fall into the black hole, and the skip comes zooming back with extra energy. It shoots into a special dock in the generating station and spins up the flywheel. So we live happily for another while, and when the flywheel begins to run out, we send out the dust cart. <laughs> That's a lovely idea, isn't it? Well, um, coming back to the present time, yes. uh, we believe black holes exist. We obviously can't see them. We, can see, we can't even see inside them. So mm. have we any real idea what happens inside a black hole? Only theory to go on in that instance. We know that stuff gets extremely squashed, so it's not recognisable. Some of the theory says it gets squashed right down to a point. Zero size, infinite density. Uh, theoreticians don't actually like zeros and infinities, so maybe it doesn't go quite there. But it gets extremely small and utterly unrecognisable. That's for sure. 
We've been saying um, blithely that nothing can get away from a black hole, no, no radiation can get out. But that isn't quite true, is it? No, it's not absolutely true. Just once in a while, once in a blue moon, you can get something out of a black hole. The black holes have this tremendous gravity, and you can think of them having big walls around them, like prison walls, to hold things in. And certainly there's no way stuff could get out over the top of those walls. No. But quantum mechanics allows the occasional tunnelling through the wall. It's hard to explain in pictorial terms. I think if you'll just believe me that once in a while something which was inside can appear outside the wall. So a little blip of light, a photon of light, can get through the wall and go whizzing off from the black hole. That makes the black hole slightly lighter. So the walls shrink a bit, which makes it actually slightly easier for the next blip of light to tunnel out, you know, in a few thousand or million years or whatever. Another blip of light gets out, which shrinks the walls, which makes it slightly easier, so the next blip of light gets out a little bit sooner. And the black hole gradually sends out these blips of light, getting faster and faster and faster. Meanwhile, it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter, and in the last stage, it just evaporates in a flash. Just like that. Well, yes, it's all fascinating stuff. And we've been talking about small black holes, comparatively yes. small ones. Yes. There is a theory, isn't there, that some of these tremendous galaxies, and above all these quasars, and maybe the cores of very active galaxies, may be powered by really vast black holes inside them. What do you think of yes, that Yes, that's idea? right. We've talked about the mini black holes in the last minute or two, and before that we were talking about star-sized black holes. But it's also been suggested that there are big black holes, you know, millions or so of solar masses inside globular clusters and um, pretty definitely in some of the galaxies the Seifert galaxies that are known to have active nuclei it's strongly suspected that they have black holes in them and as far as the quasars are concerned they're such um, powerful things and yet so far away it seems the only sensible explanation for them is a black hole in the center mass about a hundred million times the mass of the Sun it takes a bit of believing, but I suppose it's true. Jocelyn, mm. thank you very much. Thanks. Don't forget, if you want the latest astronomical information, then dial up our Sky at Night information line, the usual number, 0891 800 Or, of course, you can dial CFAX, page 685. And when I come back next month, I'll be talking about Auriga, the cosmic charioteer, with the brilliant star Capella and the little triangle of the kids. So until next month, that's it. Jocelyn... I think you will agree I was right at the start of this programme when I said that black holes were the most bizarre objects in the entire universe. Yes, I think you're absolutely right, Patrick. I don't think we'll ever get to visit one, to be honest. Well, I don't really want to. We'd rather, we'd rather devastating, wouldn't it? Yes, I know. I mean, just think about the way you'd get stretched, stretched and so out. on. I think I'd rather die. Yeah.